Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Michael Clover. I'm TI's Head of Commercial Development, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this afternoon's webinar. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to run through a bit of housekeeping. Uh, so first of all, uh, today's webinar uh, will last approximately 30 minutes, uh, and it'll be a 25 minute presentation followed by a Q&A session. Now, you can ask any question at any time during the presentation using Zoom's Q&A feature. So please do feel free to submit any questions during the presentation and we'll collate those all and we'll be uh, answering those at the end with our panelists live. Now I should say that due to the lockdown and um, with, uh, with everyone in different locations, we have uh, recorded the opening part of the presentation uh, for you now. So we'll get started with that and then we'll move on uh, to the full webinar and presentation. Hello everyone and welcome to Transport Intelligence and Apply's latest webinar looking at uh, road freight rate developments, the European road freight rate benchmark for Q1 uh, 2020. I'm joined today by uh, Andy Rawls, a quantitative analyst at Transport Intelligence, uh, and Thomas Leroux, Chief Data and Research Officer at Apply, as well as William Begudi, the road transport expert at Apply. Uh, they'll be taking us through the road uh, freight rate development uh, through this through this quarter's presentation and offering their insights uh, on the market. Um, but before we do that, I think it would be useful if uh, I could give a bit of background about each of the organisations. Uh, TI is a market research company uh, which is focused specifically on the logistics industry and has been running since 2002, providing comments on logistics and road transport in Europe. Uh, and we conducted the analysis of applies data uh, for this white paper and presentation today. Um, in order to provide some insights on how uh, the market is, is developing and moving. And we've partnered with Apply in order to uh, provide more visibility on the market for, um, uh, for uh, you know, stakeholders in the road transport market um, using Apply's uh, data, uh, which they generate. Um, and I wanted, before we move to the presentation itself, Tamar, you'd like to give a bit of background on the data that you guys are collecting and, and providing uh, through Apply. Yeah, thank you, Michael. So basically, Apply is a, is a freight uh, platform that provides two uh, products, two main products. The first one is a simplified digital marketplace where uh, basically professionals can, can buy and sell uh, road transport operations. And the second pro product is called Compare and Analyze. And, and this is this product that we are using uh, in collaboration with you, uh, GI, to produ produce this, uh, this white paper. This is um, uh, a tool that is based on the, uh, on, I mean, the, the aim of this tool is to, to, to provide information to, on, the, on, on the market, uh, more specifically um, freight uh, rates information. And we are collecting uh, data from millions of, uh, of, uh, of providers. Uh, today we have a bit uh, more than two, uh, 200 um, million uh, data of uh, rate uh, transactions and so we are using it to uh, to have a sense of what is going on in the market today okay thank you very much uh, tomar so perhaps we'll move forward now to take a look at some of the data so we'll be moving through um, some slides looking at the overall european picture and then breaking down into individual lanes and individual trends uh, to show uh, the impact uh, of uh, you know obviously covid19 on the uh, road freight market uh, through Q1, uh, which is of course um, the main factor in all of our lives right now. Um, so here we're looking at the overall European average of the 36 lanes covered by the paper and, uh, and this webinar um, and seeing how prices have changed uh, on the overall level. Um, Andy, I wonder if you'd like to provide some comments on uh, the average rate development. Sure. So uh, looking at the European road freight rate benchmark rate, we see a small drop in rates in Q1. Uh, that's 0.8% quarter over quarter or 0.2% year over year. Uh, and yeah, this is this apparent stability may come as a bit of a surprise given how coronavirus has affected the market, but, but there are a few things to note here. Uh, and firstly, though, you know, it might feel like uh, lockdowns and restrictions on everyday life have been going on for quite some time now. Uh, the first national one only began in Italy on, on March the 9th. So the first uh, month or two largely shielded from the effects of, of coronavirus. I mean, of course, there's stockpiling, uh, there's effects from China. Uh, but overall, you know, the first month or so, it, it's, it's a bit more minimal compared to the latter half of the, of the quarter. Uh, and in the first couple of months, we saw continued sort of slow economic growth in, in the European market. Retail performed okay, but manufacturing continued to suffer, much along the same lines as it had done last year. 
Uh, and then as coronavirus struck, you have uh, demand and supply side effects sort of counterbalancing one another on, a, on an aggregate level. Uh, so demand slumped in a number of sectors, uh, industrial, automotive, non-essential retail. Uh, on the flip side, you have sort of grocery demand, which has been strong due to stockpiling, but it's subsided since. Chemical and pharmaceutical volumes are, are strong throughout. But overall, demand has is, is really fallen substantially. Uh, and we'll touch on some of the uh, applies data a little bit later on in my presentation on, on, on the uh, on this demand side. Uh, on the supply side, you have uh, hauliers reacting to the circumstances by removing themselves in the market. In many instances, who, those who don't have a load, they return home. Uh, some are concerned over national restrictions affecting their movements. But for many, it's the, the lack of economic activity that makes them return home and, and thus capacity is lost from the market. Um, and I mean, according to, to a survey from a French road freight organization, uh, FNTR, that at the end of March, 86% of French road freight companies had either fully or partially stopped operations. And uh, this is really repeated across Europe. So, I mean, of course, um, there's lane by lane variation, but the aggregate of this is, is to see like, relatively uh, stable rates on, on a Europe wide basis. Mm. Okay, well, thanks very much, Andy. I think it'll be interesting to uh, take a closer look at some of those um, individual variations then across Europe, because, of course, um, the paper itself covers 36 lanes, um, some of which you can see on this. Uh, map here with the average rates for the quarter, um, but apply of course covers uh, many more lanes than that. Um, uh, Thomas, I wonder if you'd like to come in and give some comments really on, uh, on some of the variation we've seen on individual road freight lanes. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, the, the, this map uh, is uh, is showing some of the top lanes that we have uh, in this white paper and that we have in, uh, in, in apply, in the data of apply. Basically, with the data of apply, we are covering all Europe. And what is quite interesting to see is that we don't have a, a, a big up, uh, up, uh, up trend or increasing trend due to coronavirus, but we have a lot of variations, and we'll see that in the coming slides, uh, between countries or within a, within a country. And this is what is interesting and that we need to, to look at, uh, especially with the lockdown that will, be, will, uh, will stop uh, and the economy that will uh, hopefully uh, start again in Europe. Mm. Yeah, so I think it's uh, certainly true that um, that variation has also led to a lot of volatility. And I know we're going to be looking at that uh, a little later uh, in the paper as, as well. Um, and here we can look at a few of the sort of uh, different lanes and the most expensive ones, basically looking at uh, uh, price per or euro per kilometer. Um, looking at the overall trend here, um, which provides some useful insights. So, Andy, if you could uh, provide a bit more uh, information about that. Sure. Yeah, I suppose you can see there's a, it's a, a curved inverse relationship between uh, Europe per kilometers and the, and the journey distance there. Um, essentially here you have uh, the longer routes which create cost efficiencies. Uh, they diminish the significance of fixed and variable costs associated with road transport operations and, and thus lowers the price in terms of Euro kilom per kilometers. Um, but the marginal benefits attained from charging lower Euro per kilometers diminish as the journey distance gets longer. Um, so yeah, for, for example, here you can see some of the large, longer lanes here. Um, Birmingham to Madrid, uh, shippers paid 80 cents per kilometer in Q1, and uh, Duisburg to Madrid, shippers paid 93 cents per kilometer. Um, and as you'd expect, the, these two are the longest lanes, really. These, they are both approaching 2,000 2, kilometers each, respectively. Mm. Okay, thank you, Andy. So uh, perhaps now it's time to dive into some of those individual um, variations and to look at uh, how how prices have changed and I think um, both uh, Tamar and, uh, and Andy have commented on the variation on different lanes in terms of what's happened to the pricing and I think just looking at three of these very large volume lanes you can really see um, you know some more detail uh, about that here. Um, so uh, perhaps William you'd like to co come in and add some comments on some of these lanes. Yeah, I can take, um, I can take a Madrid Paris um, example to just tell that the, the price dynamics between Madrid and Paris and Paris Madrid has been bearish for the, the past year and a half. In my opinion, there are two reasons. An automotive market, which is showing signs of the weakness and which has led to a significant drop in the market in both directions. And the second reason is uh, the ancillary growth of the Spanish transport fleet, which has grown by more than 7% a year uh, for eight years in a row. So in the refrigerated tra trailer or liquid or powdery bulk. So this growth was achieved by price reductions and which made uh, shippers uh, happy. Uh, if you like also, I can, I can speak about um, Duisburg, uh, Duisburg to Rotterdam. 
mm-hmm. and especially uh, yeah, Duisburg uh, Rotterdam. And surprisingly, uh, we observed a big uh, stall for the Duisburg Rotterdam. Tensions caused by the American uh, administration have caused German exports to fall, and which is being very strong, uh, uh, which is being felt very strongly. So I underline that Rotterdam is the second port after Hamburg for German exports. Mm. Yes, thank you. It is uh, quite a stark uh, contrast there. And obviously interesting to bear in mind that, of course, even though we have COVID-19 um, you know, dominating all of our news agendas, there's still an awful lot of other factors uh, influencing road freight development and lots of nuance there as well. Um, Andy, I don't suppose you could offer some comments on Duisburg, uh, Warsaw. Yeah, so um, the rate, the lanes look relatively stable uh, going into Q1 of, of 2020. Um, but actually, if you, you know, on the monthly the data, the, the rates actually spiked uh, between February and March. It was up 4.8% month on month on transport into Warsaw and 4% into Duisburg. Um, the spoke spike coincides with uh, some border c- controls being introduced along parts of this lane um, when uh, the Polish government introduced uh, border controls aimed at uh, restricting passenger transport. It actually led to, to long queues of lorries at the border, um, increasing the, I suppose, difficulties in operating along this line, uh, along this lane, sorry. Um, and even as congestion eased over the month, there are uncertainty over driver movements, and this limited capacity uh, crossing the border into Germany, where some 95% of, of cross-border, cross-border road freight is, is undertaken by Polish drivers. So although it looks quite stable, there's actually quite a bit going on there. Mm. Thank you, Andy. Um, so yes, interesting, that last one is, is relatively stable, but when you look into the um, sort of week-to-week or, or monthly rates, um, you start to see a much more volatile uh, picture of rule. And it's worth saying that um, in this paper and webinar, we're looking at quarterly average rates, um, but uh, through TI and applies platforms, you can see uh, more um, regular updated information, looking at uh, much more higher frequency weekly rate data as well to understand you know, how things are, are changing. Um, and uh, if we look at volatility, we can see um, now how much variation of volatility there is in the market uh, on individual lanes. Um, and Andy can provide some more um, information on that. Yeah, so I mean, I suppose it's striking looking at the, the Europe-wide picture at first and seeing that the Q1 rates are, uh, are relatively stable. But yeah, as you say, it doesn't really show the actual story of what happened in the first quarter of 2020. Um, so here we've been looking to look at the, uh, the standard deviation to measure the volatility of weekly price changes in each quarter. So essentially here, a zero value for the, the standard deviation would reflect that each week prices, prices change at exactly the same rate throughout the quarter. Um, a higher value reflects the fact that weekly price changes were generally more erratic than the mean price or the average price that was charged in that quarter. So, so in this slide, we're not really trying to measure that how much uh, prices have changed by, but how volatile these changes were. Um, and this data does indeed show that at Europe-wide level, that price volatility in Q1 2020 was higher, both if you look at that year-on-year year or, or quarter-on-quarter. Quarter. So the standard deviation was measured at 0.71% in Q1 2020, uh, just 0.46% in Q1 and of 2019, or 0.57% of Q4 of 2019. So there's more, yeah, there's definitely more going on than the, uh, the relatively stable price changes suggest. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, I suppose um, that's all well and good looking at the Europe wide level. There's actually more volatility as you look at some of them on the on the individual lanes. So what, we, what we're doing here is we're comparing like for like. So we're comparing each lane uh, versus for, for Q1 2020 versus the, the, the year before. Uh, and of these here, 28 are showing more volatility than uh, they had done in, in, the, in the quarter of you know, a year ago. Um, we'd expect, I suppose, that in, in Q2 that's going to continue, that this trend is continue. We'll see plenty more volatility as well. Um, just note as well that um, I suppose the characteristics of each trade lane is different. Um, sometimes it's the proportion of contractual flows versus the spot market flows on, on each lane, which kind of determines the, the variation or the volatility on each lane. Um, but overall, if you compare like for like, if you compare the one lane versus it, you know, its p- performance a year previously, you can see overall that in Q1, that everything was, uh, well, 28 of the, the, the lanes were, were more volatile than they were previously. Mm. So interesting to see, and, and some actually there, Andy, the green ones uh, on the left, I suppose, a lot more uh, volatile than, uh, than they had been previously as well. So that's very, very interesting to see. And that's something we're gonna track um, in the future as well, looking at volatility over time. 
uh, across different lanes um, to, to understand how it's changing and, and whether or not volatility um, reduces um, as we come out of the lockdowns um, currently um, across Europe. Um, okay, well now we can look at uh, another really interesting uh, area of the data that we're covering for the uh, for the white paper, looking at um, what's happened to road rate rates to and from um, you know major uh, major ports um, in Europe, and thinking about some of those exports and um, and moving goods into into the, into, into Europe. Um, so, uh, William, I, I wonder if you could offer some comments on uh, on the overall picture to start with. Well, on the little picture, what I can say is that the curves are all bearish or so on. This price reductions are the result for me, in my opinion, um, the result of several dynamics, such as the Chinese New Year, of course, the COVID-19 uh, in Wuhan, and uh, the social crisis in French ports. So prices have dropped sharply in France from Le Havre and Marseille, minus 6% seen from Marseille. And this also explains why import prices have increased uh, from Antwerp. To, to France mainly. Huh? Uh, Le Havre flows uh, were unloaded in Antwerp and this created a higher demand and increased price. Okay, and if we look then at some of the individuals, say we look at Antwerp, um, do you have uh, any insights on, uh, on the rate development there specifically? About Antwerp? I, I told you, in fact, huh? um, the European uh, import um, increased. The, the price increase um, because in fact the demand uh, came from France, mainly from France. Um, you have to know that Antwerp is the second, uh, the first uh, French port, in fact. And uh, so uh, it explains this increase. Mm. Yes, and, and what about Rotterdam, Andy? Yeah, so I suppose um, actually the, Rot the port of Rotterdam in Q1 it saw uh, container traffic edge down 4.7% uh, in the in the first quarter of the of the year. Uh, it, it attributed this to, to weaker consumer demand overall, uh, and you can see that the kind of the lack of demand there is uh, is kind of pushing down put, uh, putting down prices slightly. Hmm. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, and if we then move on to the next slides, we can take a look here really um, following that theme of, uh, of volumes um, and, uh, and demand um, falling uh, some, somewhat for, uh, um, for, for road freight um, over, the, over the quarter. Um, Apply have uh, put together an index here which it looks at uh, volume change and how it relates to prices. Um, and I wonder if, uh, Tomai, you could offer some comments on this. Yes, so I can, I can comment, but I mean the the, the picture says every, says everything. So the 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 volumes just collapsed uh, due to coronavirus and to the lockdown of uh, of of many countries in Europe and especially the the France here. Uh, we have also a problem with um, I mean problems with the you cannot have exchange between countries, so the, the the trucks cannot come from one country to another, and some of them were coming to France. So this is also where we have a, a big issue. And if I may comment on the on the coming weeks to 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 come post lockdown, I think that this will be the the, the key point to see if the volumes are uh, increasing again or not. Uh, we we are we we are getting data for uh, the month of May uh, right now uh, and starts to uh, increase again. But the the real issue will be to see if uh, all the small carriers that we have in France and in many countries in Europe. Uh, have survived basically uh, from the coronavirus. We know that uh, carriers are, very, uh, are many carriers are quite small and don't have the the, the money to to stay uh, uh, without uh, work for many uh, weeks and months. So this will be the the key issue and the key question for the coming weeks. Mm, yeah, so it'll certainly be interesting to track uh, as volumes. Um, hopefully recover whether we're in a v-shape or a u-shaped uh, recovery and also that question around how's capacity going to look um you know exactly. post lockdown yeah. as well yeah and how that's and if i if i can uh, add just the the capacities and it will the, the the real impact on the prices will be the the balance between the offer and the demand and uh, and so we have uh, everything here so the the, the capacity is collapsed we need to see now uh, when the demand will start again and if the capacities will be here or not. Hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Okay, and actually I think you can see, you know, if you're thinking about that pricing and the meeting of uh, supply and demand there, we can look at one of the biggest uh, changes that we've seen 
um, you know, in this in this quarter, looking at Paris to Warsaw um, and the quite dramatic um, changing in prices that we've seen on that lane. Uh, Andy, could you um, offer some uh, comments there? Yeah, so for this quarter, um, Paris to Warsaw uh, rates increased 7.5% year on year. So that was the highest uh, price change we have covered in, in the white paper. Um, so it reflects a few things really. Um, demand has been strong for, for a couple of years. Uh, 2018, more strong growth in French manufacturing exports to Poland, whilst 2019, uh, it looks good increases in like cosmetics and pharmaceutical exports um, but it also looks like there's been costs passed on to shippers as well uh, looking at Eurostat's um, labour cost index uh, Poland's index for, tr for uh, labour costs has increased by 6.3% in 2018 and 6% in 2019 so it appears to be part of that is, uh, is passing the, the prices on to, to consumers there. Mm, so there's some longer term uh, trends at play um, looking at there as well. Uh, William, do you have any insights you'd like to offer on this lane as well? Uh, to, to complete what Andy said, I can just say that uh, Polish carriers hold France as leader in the battle for the mobility package in the European Parliament. So uh, Polish holders, they are afraid of police control and sanctions. So they therefore trend to, to want to avoid France. And this is uh, this had a significant inflationary impact for years, and the closing of the, of the borders or or rather the reinforced controls um, will further distance the Polish fleet, and which will add the effect of continuing inflation. And it is typically um, the opposite of what I said about uh, Paris Madrid, but I commented uh, on uh, previously. Mm. Yeah, absolutely interesting. Okay, and uh, thinking, of course, uh, that big change we saw in, in this course, we also, uh, you know, thinking ahead to how uh, the rates will develop through uh, Q2 as well, uh, and looking at uh, the situation um, in Italy, um, you know, uh, coming out of lockdown. Um, so, Andy, I don't know if you have any comments to, to make about the uh, Italian freight rates. Yeah, so yeah, I suppose we, we obviously we, we chose this because Italy was the first country to enter national lockdown. Uh, it was on March the 9th, um, and there were factory shutdowns across Italy's industrial heart and heartlands. Um, yeah, so rates fell quarter, uh, you know, over into Q1 2020. Uh, but actually in March, there was a little bit of a bounce back in rates of 0.7% of month on month. Um, we can see some differences when we look at individual lanes. Now, political moves uh, to close borders to enforce tough lockdown restrictions have led to many drivers returning home and parking up. This has also been due to the fact that demand has slumped to such a point that many are struggling to find a load. Um, so interestingly, we see Milan to Warsaw falling 2.1% month on month into March. Uh, many Polish drivers have returned home and this meant capacity has stayed strong on this lane. Uh, whereas if you look at, say, Lyon to, to Milan, uh, where there's, you know, more susceptible to, to cross trade uh, there's actually a price rise there so you know the, the capacity losing being lost from that lane but not so much on the on the Milan Warsaw lane so when Italy returns to you know whatever the new normal will look like um, it would have been in one of the longest lockdowns in Europe and um, obviously things are starting to, to change there now but it's going to be a really testing time for holidays as we've said before uh, demand growth is going to be lumpy and, and supply uh, some companies might may not come back at all so this is going to be a really interesting one to, to watch in, in the months ahead. Mm, thank you Andy and you know obviously Italy as well as road freight market is often defined by its geography um, too and its particular characteristics of the Italian market so uh, William I, I wonder if you could offer some comments on how you think those factors might play into the development um, you know of the last quarter and, and in the future. Uh, as you said um, Italian national market is a market little subjected to, to European uh, cabotage so it is therefore done by the Italian themselves even though demand has collapsed, uh, prices are fairly uh, tightly uh, regulated. So we should not be seeing a collapse in prices. On the other hand, it will be necessary to monitor the viability of the transport companies because um, the cash is uh, running out. And if a lot of uh, companies close, um, price could go up uh, quickly. And what I just said about um, uh, the, uh, the national market is not true uh, for, for the international one. And this is a domain of carriers from Central Europe. So I mean, so like yeah, Hungary, Romania, and Poland, of course. So rules of competition apply more clearly about it. And in addition, to connect Milan to Warsaw or to Lyon, you have to cross the Alps. And that is to say that tunnels and passes 
with the procession of uh, traffic jams. Uh, the Brenna between Austria and Italy, Mont Blanc and Prejus between Italy and France. And this explains why uh, the toll costs, uh, um, the highway, the motorway, uh, stabilize um, the prices. So mm -hmm. the, the, black, uh, the black curves. And uh, in fact, the variation is more um, expressed only in the return flows, which are marked on the red, uh, red on the, the graphs. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I think um, it's really interesting to see the uh, the variations by country and then to look at those individual lanes as well. And, uh, you know, in this course, we've had a lot of different um, trends to watch and I mean, there's lots of different uh, data coming in and different findings coming in on different lanes. Um, so I think I know Tamar uh, made reference to some of the um, collect data collection that, that they do, but um, having seen some of the different, um, different data uh, on Q1, um, perhaps uh, Tamar, you could explain a bit more about the data you collect and how you present it to um, you know to the market. Yes, of course. Um, so basically, we are collecting data from the market from both sides: the shippers, the carriers, even the, the freight forwarders uh, are uh, are using our platform and basically are providing uh, uh, transactional rates and insist on the fact that these are uh, real rates, uh, not uh, listed rates somewhere uh, or estimated one. Uh, and this is very important for us because, because then we give uh, insights on the market to our users. We try to do it in the most simple, simple and uh, fluid way uh, with the distinction between uh, the type of merchandise that is, uh, that is carried on by the, by the trucks, uh, the fuel surcharge, fuel surcharge that is included or not. And, um, and, and yes, and this is, uh, and we are looking today also at the, at, uh, at the volumes uh, to analyze the, the fluctuation between uh, between Europe and markets. Thank you very much, Tamar. Um, so if you'd like more information about uh, what Apply offers in terms of uh, the road freight rates, please do get in touch with them. Or if you'd like further insights on the road freight market, please do get in touch uh, with TI. Uh, you'll see uh, details on the screen. And I think now we'll move on to our Q&A session. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Um, thanks for, for listening to the presentation. Um, I'm pleased to say we've got a, a number of different questions that have uh, come through uh, during the course of the webinar. So uh, we'll go ahead and answer um, those questions for you now. Um, so I think maybe if we start with a point of clarification that um, someone has asked about the, uh, what the data from the ports uh, to their hinterlands, uh, so from Rotterdam and Antwerp represents, um, saying, uh, just for clarification, uh, the detailed charts in the section Europe import and export hubs refer to the rates for pre and on carriage of the ocean containers to the mentioned ports. Uh, is that right? Um, I wonder if Tamar, you could uh, just provide some clarification on that for us. Uh, yes, exactly. So the, the, we, we, are, we are talking about these rates. Uh, they may include also uh, some, uh, some non-linked to, uh, to um, to sea freight uh, transportation, so you can you can have also from uh, one origin to destination without any links with some containers that have to be shipped. But mainly, and the majority of what uh, what we are displaying in in, the, in these graphs are uh, what you are saying. So the rates are including pre and on carrier trade. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Tamar, for for explaining that. And I think um, it's worth saying as well that they provide uh, you know the uh, the looking and comparison, looking at how the port volumes are developing and, uh, and the rates from those lanes but that's a very good sort of measure and understanding how those things are performing. Uh, we've also just had a quick question coming in saying uh, can we have access to the document in a PDF? Yes, we'll be sending out the, uh, the report to all um, attendees uh, after, after the webinar so you'll get a copy of this as well as a replay of the uh, presentation if you um, should wish to, to listen to it. Um, Another question uh, is asking, is the market getting more open to negotiate rates down and secure capacity when participating in tenders due to uh, the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, I'm not sure who would like to answer that, whether William, you have a view on that? Perhaps? Maybe I can, uh, I don't know if uh, William oh. is, uh, his mic is uh, working or not, but I can answer if you want. Um, Go ahead. Uh, on this one, and it's, it's uh, the question is quite linked with the second one that we see. Um, the second one is, uh, but capacity doesn't seem to uh, drive price down at the same level, and this is really the, the, the question here. We see capacities that collapse, but the prices are quite stable, and, and this is exactly what uh, we were saying: is that on average, the 
prices are quite stable because volume are low. So basically we are, don't have up and downs uh, that are quite um, shocking, uh, but we have high fluctuations. So we can see on some corridors and in specific industries, uh, especially if we, if we look at, uh, at, um, at um, um, sorry, I don't know if I find my word, but in some industries, and especially if we, if we are looking uh, at uh, people uh, at uh, the, the food industry, uh, here we have some corridors where the price uh, skyrocket because of very high uh, demand and no capacities on the market. Uh, but the real question will be for uh, post lockdown, uh, do we have enough capacity to balance the demand? And if the balance, if the demand is very high, uh, my feeling is that prices might rise because of high demand, low capacity, uh, this is exactly the, the kind of market where basically you, you will be able maybe to re renegotiate some, some rates, but usually when you will be as a shipper, someone who is buying capacities, try to renegotiate this rate, maybe you won't have uh, enough people uh, on the other side or at least less uh, carriers uh, that you that used to be. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Tamar. It's, it's really interesting that question about what's going to happen obviously in Q2 and looking at Supply and demand, demand falling, but also capacity being taken out of the market. I know we've been uh, trying to measure um, some of the effects of that, both for this uh, paper, but also for um, some of the research that TI is publishing over the coming, coming months as well. Um, Andy, I don't know if you've got a view on uh, how you expect um, rates to sort of develop in the future in that supply and demand balance. Yeah, I mean, as, as, as Thomas said, I suppose that we've been if demand is, is driven up uh, we see kind of a, a sharp recovery in demand uh, but if capacity can't come back online and you might expect to see uh, rates are increasing um, by some rate uh, this will be kind of lumpy uh, in the in the sense that you know there's gonna be sectors coming on back online at certain sta certain stages uh, and capacity won't always be able to react to that and you know obviously we have the the different regional variations as well so I mean I think that the kind of in terms of expectations for the next quarter it's volatility really that's that's the main thing um, but as you say if if, the, if that demand does come back online and, and perhaps some of the, the holdings don't come back online that's quite as quickly then then demand then prices could increase yes uh, absolutely I mean I think that's uh, that's sort of the level of expectation really I mean it also one thing that's interesting looking at the way capacities come out of the market certainly um, looking at a lot of hall is taking um, losing capacity and losing loads. Uh, it does raise questions around, um, you know, whether some routes are viable. So, for instance, in co conversations with certain clients uh, that we've had at TI, um, looking at road freight shipments across the channel um, into the UK, a lot of the, uh, you know, if you're losing your base load or your return load, uh, which you may have been taking, it makes the whole uh, trip uh, somewhat uneconomical. Um, we've had another question come in saying, you know, what is the lowest floor at which the rates can go uh, cost per kilometer before the majority of the carrier base capacity is not able to pick up the loads. Um, so, you know, that sort of cross um, channel uh, freight from France to the UK is, is one example where um, that's a bit of a problem. But um, uh, Toma, you have a view on, on that question? Uh, tricky question, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> William, maybe you, you want to, 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 to take this one. I, I, I took uh, yours at the beginning, so this one. Thank for you me. for the gift, Thomas. Uh, <laughs> 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 Honestly, I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, it's uh, yes, it's a tricky question. I don't know the. Um, I don't know to answer. So sorry. <laughs> sorry. <It's>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I might i might give just have a try of this one um the, i mean <laughs> the um yeah so birmingham to madrid is the longest lane we have covered in the white paper um and you can kind of see the curved inverse relationship it does sort of tend towards a a, a kind of a minimum value we, we don't actually have a, a figure on that specifically uh it's, it's one we'll look to tracks certainly but you can see as uh you know, the longer the longer the journey is, it, it does tend to kind of a, a lower figure. Uh, but yeah, there will be a, obviously a certain cutoff point. But um, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have the uh, a, a specific figure for that. Mm. Yeah, I suppose obviously it will often vary by uh, uh, by lane there really as well. So it's also worth mentioning that um, TI is doing some research at the moment for our upcoming road freight transport report, which is looking at um, the relationship between volumes and various other factors and um, and how companies are performing and company failures. So. Uh, yeah, a lot of people have been asking about um, capacity in the market and how many smaller operators particularly are going to be left. Um, and so that's some work that uh, we're working through at the moment to understand 
uh, what kind of impact that might um, have on uh, on the market um, as well. So um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to answer that question um, in a, in a couple of weeks' time once um, the research is completed and that uh, uh, work is is published as well. Um, okay, we still got quite a few um, questions um, coming through. Um, so there's a question here about the uh, international market versus um, uh, versus the domestic market, um, and uh, and asking uh, whether we think uh, rates will be affected more on the international markets uh, or more on the domestic markets. Um, so uh, I don't know if anyone particularly want, has an idea of that or wants to answer on that on that point. Um, I suppose that you know, with the countries coming back online at different rates, um, you know, with you know the UK, we're, we're just in, kind of leaving the lockdown uh, as of today, really, uh, or you know, to a certain extent at least. Um, I think that you know the, the fact that different countries will come on, online at different points does point to international lanes potentially being more more volatile. Um, that would be my suggestion. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I can maybe I can try to, to complete this. Uh, I think that there is a, um, a big possibility that the domestic market is going to to uh, to decrease. Price is going to decrease because um, the demand will be um, weak, and of course um, the offer will be big. So there is a, a high possibility to to decrease the price. And on the contrary, uh, international transport is done by by polish driver mainly polish or lithuanian you know uh, all these uh, countries uh, from the east of europe and at the moment um, we are not able to, uh, to 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 join us or to reach uh, their market so uh, there is a possibility to to, to have uh, an increase of this price but this is my uh, only my opinion no? mm. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, thank you, William. I think um, uh, is it, it, all these questions are very complex, and, and there's so many different factors that come in. It's always interesting to hear views and opinions as to how they affect the price dynamics there. Um, another quite specific question we've had come in is uh, looking at: um, uh, Do you have any insights into how current rates compare to operating costs? Which I think Andy um, has has a view on. Yes, I suppose. I mean, this this course is probably the one where the operating costs, uh, the correlation with rates is, is probably the you know, it's probably the least correlation for for, for quite some time. Um, you know, this is more about the demand and supply side, really, and how how drastically that's really changed over, over the last quarter due to coronavirus. Um, we've, you know, in previous white papers, we've looked at how that kind of changes with diesel price and, and labour costs and such like that, and that has a bit more of a correlation. But this quarter, certainly, it's, it's uh, there's operating costs matter less uh, than demand and supply in, in Q1. Mm. Yeah, thanks Andy. Okay, and I think um, looking at sort of uh, maybe the last question here, we've got one more on um, asking about uh, any risk of uh, around Brexit on uh, on average rates um, and any sort of projections we have. Um, with all the I think going on with COVID-19, it uh, seems a long time since we were talking about Brexit now. Um, but I think a couple of points on that really, we, we were looking at that as being a major um, you know, a major factor in, in Q1. Um, but of course, uh, it's also worth bearing in mind, as we spoke about in the, um, you know, paper in Q4, uh, that actually most of the impact of that is expected to come at the end of the transition period later in the year. So, um, you know, the data from the sort of official leaving of the UK from um, the EU at the end of January, um, you know, so we have, uh, don't tell us much about the future um, there, but of course, um, you know, we'd be looking at friction and longer, um, the wait times to move between uh, the countries we'd expect that to have an impact on, on rates um, and there are perhaps some lessons we can learn about uh, what, how that will affect the market from some of the border closures and, um, and queuing we saw uh, you know at the outbreak of, um, of the lockdowns uh, in, in Europe and between different countries there as well. Okay well, thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining us um, today. Now, as I said at the start um, uh, of the Q&A session, we'll be uh, very uh, happy to send out a copy of, the, uh, of this presentation, a recording of the presentation, and, of course, the actual uh, white paper, which we've been referring to, um, you know, uh, after the uh, webinar has um, concluded. So you'll all be able to read uh, in an 
a lot more detail. Uh, but obviously, I'd encourage you to keep the conversation going. So if you do have any questions about, um, you know, the data you've seen in the report um, and you want to, uh, you know, more help and assistance, benchmarking rates and understanding rate development, then I definitely encourage you to get in touch with Apply if you have questions or looking for, for more data there. And if you've got questions looking at the road freight transport market trends and developments that we're seeing, I'd also encourage you to get in touch with TI um, to discuss how, how the market is um, is, uh, is moving forward. So please do use the contact details you have on the screen um, and uh, the contact details in your invitations and when we send you the follow-ups for the white paper um, there if you want to get in touch further. Um, so all that remains for me to do is to say thank you for us for joining us and to thank all the panelists, uh, Tamar, William and Andy for offering their views uh, and insights. And I hope that you can all join us um, in the next quarter um, in, a, in a few months time. Okay, thank you, bye-bye.